Luke chapter 22. One of the reasons the gospel is so uh, believable to me, the stories about Jesus that we find in the gospels are so believable, is because of the way they portray the disciples. Consider that the disciples wrote these gospels, and, and in each gospel, the gospel writers are often portrayed as selfish, childish, sinful, and the list goes on. Uh, does anyone here like to talk about the failures you've had in life? Would you raise your hand if you'd like to talk about your failures? Anyone? I was going to say, uh, after the service, if you'd like, we'll just all stay here and see that, you know, see that you can tell us about all the times you failed in life. No one wants to do that. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to do it either. Uh, so that's part of what makes, to me, the gospel so believable. The disciples talking about their failures. Jesus is planning to die for the sins of everyone on earth. One of the disciples plans to betray him. The rest are arguing about which one of us is the greatest. You know, it's me, it's me. They're, they're arguing about this. And the one who will become their leader after the resurrection of Jesus, his name is Peter, he will end up denying him three times that night. And every one of the Gospels tell us about this. So uh, the Gospel accounts are true, and that's why the disciples look like failures at times, because they were failures at times. You and I will be failures at times. So let's look at Luke 22, beginning in verse 31. Jesus said, As Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out without money belt and bag and sandals, you did not lack anything, did you? No, nothing. And he said to them, but now whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag. And whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with transgressors, for that which refers to me has its fulfillment. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. So first I want you to notice what I call in this passage, the bombshell on Peter. Look out, Peter, you're about to hit with, be hit with a bomb. Uh, Jesus tells Peter in verse 34, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. I see some irony in this passage. Uh, Peter is uh, one of the most overconfident individuals among these disciples. And he responds to Jesus. Look, look at this supreme confidence he has. Lord, with you I'm ready to go to both prison and to death. Lord, I'm, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's almost like he's, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm willing to die for you. Would you say that Peter was cocky or cocksure? Um, I tend to think so. <laughs> I'm chuckling because uh, I looked up the definitions of these words, cocky and cocksure. And, you know, it's because later on the rooster is going to crow and he'll end up denying Jesus three times before the rooster crows. The rooster is a cock, right? A male bird. And, uh, I was just curious, where did these words uh, cocksure and cocky come from? And there's even some disagreement. You know what etymology is? It's the study of the origin of words. There's a disagreement about um, where, where these words originated from. So someone put, uh, put it this way. 
Since they couldn't figure it out for sure, they said, I found it best not to be too cocksure of any etymology. Okay, pardon me if I'm, I just chase a little rabbit right here from time to time. Um, but uh, Peter is cocky. Uh, I, I think right, roosters are pretty cocky. They get out there in the, the hen yard and, and they'll crow. And, and What are they saying? Are they saying like, I'm the boss around here? Is that what they're saying? Uh, maybe so. I, I tend to think so. But I think they really have little to be cocky about. Uh, many of them will end up losing their heads and become a chicken dinner. I think Peter had little to be cocky about. But he was confident. Lord, I'm not going to. You can count on me, Lord. I'm not going to do these things. You can count on me. Uh, we probably all have felt that way at times. But he is one of the bravest of the apostles. Who else walked on the water outside of Jesus but Peter? He was willing to step outside the boat. And when they came to uh, take Jesus and capture him that night, he pulled out a sword and he cut off the ear of a man named Malchus. Well, I believe it's one of the high priest's servants. And we know his name because John 18.10 tells us Luke, the Gospel of Luke doesn't mention his name. But John 18, 10 says, Simon Peter then having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. Now it's interesting to me that it's only in the gospel of John that we find out that Peter did this. And it's only uh, in the gospel of John we find out the name of the slave was Malchus. Uh, that's my understanding. By the way, if, if you ever find I'm incorrect about something, feel free to share it. I, I want to be correct in what the scripture says. It's possible that the other gospels don't mention the name of Peter or Malchus because uh, this would have been an act of rebellion and Peter could have been arrested. And of course, uh, if, if Malchus's ear is healed, which Jesus did, there would be no evidence that Peter did this deed. And then if you say, well, he cut off his ear, but Jesus put it back on and healed him. Uh, well, that sounds like Jesus is able to do miracles and that wouldn't go too well. Anyway, uh, back to Peter here. He had courage, but he also failed. There will be times in your life and my life. I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet, but I just know myself and uh, I'll just put it this way. I'm not gonna say I know you. I'll just say uh, the truth is all of us will fail at times. And here is something that's so wonderful. God loves you and me <coughs> in spite of our failures. And he will continue to love us in spite of our failures. The question is whether or not we will accept his love and forgiveness. Notice that Peter meant to be faithful, and you and I mean to be faithful to the Lord, but there will likely be times we're not. Jesus said in this passage, all of the apostles would fall away as a fulfillment of prophecy. In Mark 14, 27, it says, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the spirit shall be, oh, pardon me, and the sheep shall be scattered. So keep in mind, when you fail, when you fall into sin, I'm not excusing it. I'm just saying that when it happens, the disciples also fail. Our Lord still loved them. He still loves you. And I want to emphasize that because there are sometimes Christians feel like I, I failed. I'm not going to go back to church. I failed the Lord. I just feel so bad. No, that's where you need to be in church to be reminded of God's love, to hear the word of God, to meet with the Lord. Satan desired to sift Peter and Satan seeks to sift you. 
And of course, there is a spiritual battle taking place in our nation. There are spiritual battles taking place in many families. Maybe in where you work, there are spiritual battles taking place. Satan desires to sift Peter. He desires to sift you. And by the way, what is uh, sifting? Well, I'm talking to probably some of you are farmers and you can tell me more about this than I know. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is back in the day, uh, they would have what they called a sieve and they would put some of the, uh, the grain in there, uh, but there would be some rocks with it and some other things. And so they would shake it, the sieve, and, and maybe some of the grain would fall to the ground. And uh, this was a way to get, uh, to purify uh, the grain. That's my understanding of what was taking place. And so Satan wanted to, to take, this is figurative language, he wanted to take Peter and sift him. In other words, he wanted to shake him and find some impurities in his life. But he did so for the sake of the desire to condemn him. That's what Satan wanted to do. Now, God may show you impurity in your life by his Holy Spirit to convict you, to purify you, and to get you right with him. So don't misunderstand about Satan's desire. He wants to show you your failures, to condemn you, and tell you God will never forgive you. No, God wants to convict you so you can turn from that sin, follow Jesus, and be purified and cleansed in his sight. And it's a continual process for us. Notice Peter's response to all this again in verse 33. Lord, with you, I am ready to go both to prison and to death. Peter was sure of himself. He was confident in himself. This is the kind of message you're going to hear in our culture today. Believe in yourself. You can do it. Believe in yourself. No, I'd urge you, trust the Lord. Believe in him. Trust him. Let him change you <coughs> inside so that you're seeking his will and you're doing his will and you're seeking him first in your life. Proverbs 28, 26 says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. The scripture says that. Don't trust in yourself. Trust in God. Peter was self-confident and he had another problem. Uh, it was a lack of prayer. In Luke 22, verses 45 through 46, it says, When Jesus rose from prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. They were sorrowful about what Jesus was telling them. He was about to be betrayed, and they were sorrowful about this. And what did they do? Did they pray about it? No, they went to sleep. Jesus, uh, Peter had a problem with a lack of prayer. And Jesus said to them in Luke uh, twenty-two forty-six, 46, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, I'm not opposed to sleep. We all, we all need sleep at times. Uh, I prefer you not sleep in church, but it's okay if you do. You know. But we all need prayer, too. Are you spending time in prayer? We need to. So the disciples were sleeping instead of praying. Peter was self-confident. Peter slept instead of praying. The time of sifting, the time of trials, is not a pleasant time. In Matthew 26, 75, it explains what happens the third time that Jesus denied the, pardon me, that Peter denied the Lord that, that night. And it says there in Matthew 26, 74, then he, Peter, <coughs> hear this, began to curse and swear I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster, rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, Before rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out 
and wept bitterly. Luke 22, verses 60 and 62 added this. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he told him, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Satan desires to sift us, to bring us down, to destroy us. That is, this is purpose. Now, by the way, there is an evil being named Satan. Someone likes to, <laughs> to say that's a fairy tale, it's, it's not true. It, you know, there's no goblins, there's no imps, there's no devil. No, there is a devil in this world. He is the opponent of God. And the reason I know that's certain, that's true, is because Jesus believed in him and spoke to him and resisted him and affirmed his reality. So uh, there's something here that's interesting to me that uh, Jesus says that uh, Satan has demanded permission to sift you, demanded permission. Now think about this. Is it, I'd be curious if you can tell me afterwards of, of sometime when someone has demanded your permission to do something. Demanded, I want you to let me do this now. I'd be interested to hear about that. It just kind of strikes me funny that Satan demanded permission. The truth is, God is all powerful. And Satan can't do just whatever he wants. But God allows him to do a lot of things. And uh, I want to describe to you some ways in which Satan wants to attack us. He likes to attack you when you're under stress. Okay, that's understandable. He likes to attack you when you come under stress or before you come under stress. Okay? And he likes to attack you right after you're under stress and you have a victory. In other words, he likes to attack you all the time. <laughs> but sometimes it's after we have a great victory that we don't realize this attack is coming. You might remember that Joshua went to God in prayer when he faced Jericho. How, how is his army going to possibly defeat uh, and win this battle of Jericho? And he goes to God in prayer. And God brings about a great victory. The next battle is the battle with a little town called Ai. Oh, we didn't need to, all the soldiers for this battle. It's a small battle. Don't worry about it. We got it. No need to pray about it. And he suffers defeat. He sends out a small det detachment, an army of his army, and they're defeated. And then he realized, I should, I, should, I should have gone to God in prayer about this. You see, when I'm facing a battle like Jericho in my life, I, I know I need to go to God in prayer because I don't see a way to get victory. But it's often with these smaller battles in our lives, like Joshua had with the battle of Ai, that he realizes, uh, or he thinks he doesn't need to go to God in prayer, but he does. In other words, there can be the huge battles where we know we need God and we go to him in prayer. But the truth is we need him in prayer even when it appears that we don't need him in prayer. One of Peter's strongest, strongest points is his courage. And, and uh, by the way, <laughs> if there's anybody that I would refer to as a Hebrew redneck, it'd probably be Peter. If he was alive today, I think he'd be wearing cowboy boots and he'd have a shotgun in the back of his pickup. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's just kind of uh, what I think of Peter. And sometimes I think we're a little bit like him. In his pride, Peter thought he was the most loyal apostle, apostle, and he ended up having one of the greatest failures. Satan 
likes to attack us after a great victory in our life. He likes to attack us at any time. I believe Peter was the key to this group. If, that's interesting. In Luke 22, 31, uh, your uh, texts don't really indicate this. But Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. You may think he's talking just to Peter, but the you is in the plural. He's talking to all the disciples. Satan wanted to sift all of them. And Jesus said, uh, and I will pray for you. That's singular. Satan wants to destroy all of you. He wants to sift all of you. Peter, I'm praying for you. Peter was the leader. Uh, can I just put it this way? Pray for those who are leading or seeking to lead others. In other words, pray for your pastor. <laughs> pray for uh, uh, any deacons in your church, any leaders in your church. Pray for them. Pray for them. But Satan wants to sift all of us. And uh, that's what he told Peter. He, Satan wants to sift all of you. But Peter, I'm praying for you. Peter would end up denying our Lord, but the Lord would forgive him. And the more we become more like Jesus, the more easily we will forgive others for their failures. All right. I'm going to move on from the bombshell on Peter to the break with the past. Okay, and I only have two points today. This is the second point. We're gonna, and this won't be as long as the first one. Luke 22, 35, he said to them, Jesus said to his disciples, when I sent you out without money belt and bag and sandals, you did not lack anything, did you? They said, no, nothing. And he said to them, but now whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag. And whoever has no sword in it is to sell his coat and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with transgressors. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Jesus is now preparing them for their lives, their ministry, without him being present. If they lacked bread previously, he could feed 5,000. So they always knew wherever and whenever they were with him. I mean, he could walk on the water. So, you know, what's the worry? Just trust him, he'll provide. But now he's not going to physically be with them. They can still trust him to provide. But he also says, you need to take your some money with you. Uh, the bag that, that they took would be for their, some provisions. It's not wrong for missionaries when they go on the field to prepare for that and to take something with them. They're still <coughs> trusting God to provide, but they're still preparing and uh, taking care for what's going to happen in the future. Now here's what's uh, one of the, some consider the strangest command in this passage in verse 37. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Now, why is this a little strange? Well, a cloak would have been used at that time, not only for uh, to cover yourself, when it, maybe in cold weather, but also if you were to go to sleep at night in a field, you could cover yourself with that cloak. And, you, and here he's saying, it's more important to get a sword, to buy a sword instead of having a cloak. Why did Jesus tell them this? Uh, if we had, uh, you know, if this wasn't a sermon, I'd just love to hear your opinions about it. <laughs> because I've seen about six different opinions as to why Jesus said this. Uh, it may have been that uh, uh, he was saying this because it would be important when they're traveling in different places to have some means of self-defense in case some robbers came after them. That's possible. I don't think it's wrong for someone to uh, to uh, try to defend themselves. 
Uh, Jesus is certainly not calling for military revolution, by the way. Two swords would not have been adequate. Uh, this kind of sword was a large knife. It wasn't the largest sword uh, that you could get, uh, but also this sword was sometimes used to uh, cut up animals and to uh, get the flesh ready to cook. Okay, I'll move on to something else. You know, but that would be a way to provide yourself on a trip if you were to uh, need to eat an animal. And another possibility is that Jesus is preparing his disciples for his betrayal. And he's telling them two swords would be adequate. So they would appear to be transgressors in the sense they've got some swords with them, uh, but they didn't really have enough swords to you know, bring about a defense and try to rescue him. There's various opinions about this. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the different views. I'll, I'll just say that uh, they, there's, it's just, I don't think, certainly there's anything wrong, wrong with defending yourself if someone's trying to rob you. I think that's certainly true here. And, and also it's, uh, it's appropriate to prepare beforehand, before ministers go somewhere, before missionaries go somewhere. Uh, and I, I think you find that that's what ministers, and, uh, you, you prepare beforehand for whatever ministry you believe God's calling you to. Okay, in closing again, I want you to go back to Luke 22, verse 31. It says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Again, I've already mentioned this. I kind of chuckled when I read that one time. Satan is demanding permission. Don't ever forget, God is all powerful. He may allow things to happen to you that are not pleasant, but he can accomplish great things in our lives by allowing some of those things to happen. He loves you. He wants what's best for you. Uh, you can be both sad and glad at the same time when you enter into some trials. James says, consider it all joy. God knows what's best for you. He will bring you through it as you trust him and you will grow in your relationship with him. That's what we find happening with Peter. He would find out he couldn't trust himself. He needed to trust God. That's what he found out through this experience. One of the things, God created Satan. Satan chose to rebel by his own free will why does God permit Satan to do that? I, second, I think uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 gives the answer. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. There is much evil in this world. Satan is behind it. And of course, uh, those who are unbelievers and sometimes even believers are working with him. Uh, hopefully it's uh, when it's believers, it's not intentionally. But there's a lot of evil in this world. God has allowed evil to exist so that we could love him and come to know him. So God loves you. He wants you to love him. Don't be surprised when failure comes in your life. It's happened to me, it'll happen to you, it happens to everyone. Turn from trusting in yourself, trust in the Lord, and trust him. Grow in your relationship with him, love him more. And of course, if someone's listening who's not truly a believer, that's the first step you need to take. Turn from your sins, put your faith in Jesus as Savior. And Lord, would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, I'm so thankful for your love for us in spite of our failures. Like Peter, 
We may even deny you at times. Like the other apostles, we may run when we should take a stand. Help us, Lord, to be faithful, to take a stand for the truth. And thank you for loving us and forgiving us, even when we do turn away. And Lord, if there's someone here who needs prayer this morning, they're welcome to come, and I will be glad to join them in prayer. And Lord, if there's someone who wants to just come and kneel before the Lord and meet with you, that's fine. Lord, if there's someone who needs to make a decision that God's leading them to do something, I pray that they will do what you want. We thank you for your love for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?